Hello everyone, Jez here from UHQ. Welcome to our second Wellbeing Wins webinar. I'm really pleased to have with us today John Tate. John is many things, but he's Director of Education at the Northern Lights Learning Trust. He's a published author. Um, he speaks to leaders. He's also uh, the host from the sidelines. Um, John, there's almost too many titles to give you. You are, seem like such a busy man. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, you're welcome, Jess. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, it's good. Raining outside, as it probably is for, for a lot of people in the country. But um, yeah, yeah, really good. Had a good week so far and looking forward to, to chatting, really, uh, to parents, hopefully, tonight about how they can really help at home from a, you know, academically, emotionally, uh, you know, from a supportive point of view to really help them get their children through, you know, schooling and, and everything that we can do to do that. So, yeah, really looking forward. We're really pleased to have you on, John. And, and I think, you, you know, you come at this from so many different angles as well. Um, we will just put a caveat in. It's pretty grim up north for you. It's also pretty grim down south for me. So we will hopefully not have any internet um, issues. If you do, if you are there live with us and, and we do start to glitch out a little bit, we'll do our best to cover. But John, can you just tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and your background? You've got a really interesting background as a teacher in education. And obviously you've, you've developed a real passion for teaching and learning and gone on to do all these things. And you've created podcasts and all the content that you create. Can you just tell us a bit more about you. Yeah, thanks. So I've been in teaching for over 20 years now. Uh, started as a PE teacher and actually before that I was a sports coach. So I went out to America, coached football for a couple of times, um, got into PE teaching, then started coaching American football actually and I ended up coaching American football for Great Britain. Um, but I, I taught PE for, for a long time, then moved through to a head of year through the pastoral route, uh, then into assistant head teacher in charge of behaviour, safeguarding, welfare, that kind of stuff. Uh, then a deputy head teacher in charge of teaching and learning which is really where my kind of, the, the, the pastoral side really kind of you know, dovetailed with the, the teaching and learning side with me. Um, and then into uh, a couple of trust roles I've had so far, I've had a deputy CEO role of a trust and now director of education at a trust. And then along the way, as you mentioned, I've written five books. Never ever would I have thought I'd have done that as a, as a C grade kid myself at school. Um, but yeah, I've been lucky enough to be able to to put my thoughts down and use my experiences and expertise um, to, to help other people. And it's great that when somebody messages me and says, I've read your book or, and, and I'm in this country or that country or in this school, to be able to have that impact far wider than the four walls of any classroom it, it has been really, really great. So I've been really grateful for that. Uh, I speak at lots of events and conferences and hopefully try and pass my expertise on. So I'm always trying to hopefully help people, whether they're teachers, students, parents, you know, become a better version of themselves. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's kind of where that's come from. And um, hopefully it's it, it's helping you know, wherever, wherever people are tonight and wherever people, you know, kind of ended up, end up kind of um, finding me on, on social media or wherever. It's always great to talk to a fellow PE teacher, John. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes I feel very lonely as a PE teacher, but no, great, great to talk to you. And it's really interesting for me because I think PE teachers often do go down that pastoral route, don't they? Because often PE teachers naturally feel quite at home with those sorts of, those sorts of roles and conversations. I'm interested to know, when did that um, passion then, or you, you mentioned that time when you really became super passionate about teaching and learning, and that seems to be what you talk a lot about now, or that's definitely, I've been very privileged to be in the audience and hear you talk about teaching and learning specifically. And we're gonna start, we're gonna talk to parents specifically today about how they can support their children from home, from a teaching and learning or an academic perspective, but also we're gonna try and link that in with wellbeing as well. Was there a moment where you went, no, actually, look, I, I really am super passionate about the way people learn rather than that pastoral side? I think it was, I, I started uh, blogging quite a bit and I think it was, you know, I, I, I'd got onto Twitter. I was using Twitter from a um, from a, a news point of view to kind of get you know, news as a lot of people do now very kind of quickly. And I started different things that I'd done in my classroom and I was connecting with other teachers and leaders across the country and then across the world. And it just suddenly opened up this huge potential and possibility that we can now share expertise directly and very quickly from the classroom to another classroom across the world um and it just really got me engaged and inspired in that so i think that was where it was really and then my writing my blogging my then published writing kind of came on the back of that um and speaking at events and and, and kind of being asked to speak at places so i think it was all just basically seeing suddenly how digital technology could then open up and remove those barriers with what it used to be and i think also and i've mentioned this a few times when i've when i've spoken previously that when I first started teaching, it felt like to write a book or to or to have something published, you needed to be a professor at Cambridge, Oxford, whatever. Suddenly, with blogging and free blogging, 
I could then and anybody could then actually be, you know, publish something and have it read by somebody, another teacher, <clears throat> and feel quite authentic. And what that has led, I suppose, a movement in teaching is that people who are still teaching are able to write books and have things published who are very current rather than people who maybe haven't been in the classroom or haven't been in the classroom for a long time. So I think that that movement has been really useful. And that's all down really to blogging and social media platforms where people can suddenly publish for free. Obviously, there's a danger with that, that just because it's published and it's live on the internet doesn't mean to say it's therefore real or doesn't mean to say it's therefore right or correct. So we, our eyes have to be able to sense check that. But it, it has enabled lots of people to share lots of ideas very, very quickly. Um, as we've seen, even you know, as from our background from sports as well, you know, to be able to have a report that's you know that, that that's put from a football ground a minute after the final whistle that you can receive on your phone, you know, and whether that's a video report or a written report, that 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 age of like getting news to people and information very quickly is just as relevant within education as it is within you know news report and journalism. And I think that's that's an interesting point and something we might come on to later is that that want for young people, they want it straight away, don't they? They, they want the information immediately. And, and I'm sure that's something that we can look at when we start talking about how we can support young people from home and, and, the, and the sort of routines and, um, and the effort they need to put into sometimes into, into actually making that home environment a good learning environment. They, I, I'm interested as well, just you, you seem really hot on um, the resources that you offer for free. Is that something you're really consciously trying to do? You, you produced all this, all the stuff you've produced recently and the, from the sidelines, website you've created which looks great it all, it's all available for free you don't need to be a subscriber or anything like that is that something that you're you're purposefully doing for, for the teaching community yeah i'm really passionate about kind of um the fact that we all need help at various stages of our career professionally our parenting kind of life our our own you know, kind of developmental life and i feel like now i'm in, in a not from a big-headed way but i feel like i'm in a position where i can be the person that i needed maybe when i first started out either as a parent or as a teacher or as a young person so i think that we shouldn't just feel that we are consumers of this information which if you can get to a stage where you can be a contributor and you can actually be a producer of this then why not and i think that um i'm also really passionate that i don't want it to be behind paywalls for a lot of people because I'm really passionate about, I was a free school meal kid as a, as a, as a child. So I'm really passionate about trying to um, bridge the poverty gap. And actually, if, if everything has a paywall in front of it, then actually all I'm doing is is is, is contributing more to the poverty gap and, and contributing more to a kind of a, a have and a have not. So I think actually, let, let's get this out there for free. Let's see what we can help. And my, my infinite purpose, I suppose, is to kind of always try to help as best I can. Now, that's why I got into teaching, and I still feel I'm a teacher now, even though I don't teach as much anymore. I'm just teaching and helping adults or parents or you know, kids in a different in a different uh, way and teachers. So if I can help and it can make a difference to people, then um, that, you know, that, that, that's what I'm here for. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's hopefully what I'm doing. How often do you teach now, John? And also, what have you noticed any big differences in the teaching world? We obviously speak to teachers very much who are looking at um, mental health and well-being, personal development and safeguarding seem to be the main themes that crop up for us. What what differences have you noticed and how often do you get to be in the classroom these days? So I don't I don't I don't have any set classes anymore in terms of the role I do as director of education, but I'm in classes a lot in terms of in and out of classrooms, you know, every day in terms of watching teachers, seeing how things are, supporting teachers, et cetera, et cetera. So I've still got a really good grasp on what's happening. And one of the as you quite rightly pointed out, James, one of the biggest things is that on the back of COVID, we've seen some significant um, or, or, or further significant issues with, with, with how that's impacted on mental health, uh, with anxiety, with uh, attendance as well. Um, and actually things have become you know, a, lot, a lot more difficult for, for a lot of families uh, because the cost of living crisis, as we've seen, has, has also come at a, a, a similar time. So there are the world has changed, as we know, um, and that, that's exactly the same for education as it is for you know, a supermarket in terms of, you know, their prices have gone up and, and, and the delivery costs and very, very similar things have happened to teaching. And, um, you know, that's not just for the students as well. There are a lot of, um, you know, people who work in schools that are also feeling that. So it's not just not just actually the uh, the students, but also the adults themselves. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, John. John, on to your um, From the Sidelines podcast. Can you t can you tell us a bit more about, about that and, and what was the inspiration behind it? Um, and the fact that obviously you're, you're gearing that towards parents and we'll come on to some of the topics that you've put into that. Where, where did that idea come from? Well, it, 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 so what it is, it's, it's, it's a project called From the Sidelines and we've got, we've got one minute study hack videos 
uh, which which basically break down how parents can help at home in a very, very quick, short, one minute kind of fashion. Along with that, as you mentioned, there is a, a very short, I say very short, 12 to 15 minute podcast that, that, that links to that. Um, and the, the passion for that really was that I'm a parent myself and been able to kind of pull both of my hats together in terms of my what I know from an education point of view, but also what I've learned from a parenting point of view. And I have so many conversations with parents who say that they want to help, but they don't know how to. And I often think that the the conversation that I get into is that parents say, well, but I don't know Shakespeare, or I don't know physics, or I, I struggle with maths. And my answer is always, well, you don't need to know the content because actually there's lots of ways that you can help by, you know, and I know we'll get onto this in a few minutes, but in terms of creating the right study environment at home or, you know, timing them for a certain amount of time or asking these type of questions, not about the content, but just changing two or three words, you can make a huge difference as a parent just by knowing how to help without having to the content. So I, I really feel that, going back to one of my answers previously, in terms of I'm now in a privileged position that I feel like I, I have got enough knowledge and experience from a parenting point of view as well as an education point of view to put both these two things together to help parents um to help parents help their help their children through schooling uh, and all of these ideas are like you said freely available but they're also free to enact as well so it's not about you need to go out and buy five revision guides or you need to do this actually it's all things that people can do for free very quickly i'm not saying these things are easy because i'm a parent of two teenagers myself so i know the challenges i know will come on to that but actually just because it's hard doesn't mean to say we shouldn't then try you know to do it so it's about me trying to help parents and give them as much information as they can um in a in a bite-sized way because this is not about me wearing a shirt and tie as, a, as an education leader lecturing a parent saying this is how you become a good parent this is me talking to people parent to parent saying you know in, in a very hopefully uh, informal and social way saying actually try this this is you know that you can do this and this works and hopefully make uh, people see that they can help and they can do it very very quickly if 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 they want to and that that's the big thing that you know some of these things people say ah I know what you're saying but I, I, I just don't want to do that so if there's a want and there's a will then uh, you know there's certainly a way that's great and it's it's from the sidelines.uk isn't it Sophie put, uh, put the banner on the bottom uh, and it's free it's, it's available to anyone it, it's not just you know people in in your area parents in your area it's literally it's there and anyone can access it there's no login you just go to the straight to the site and you can access like you said the, the one minute hacks and then if you're in what i found looking at it earlier today you've got the one minute hack which intros it and then there's a kind of 15 minute slightly long but still bite-sized episode um where you go on and talk a little bit more about it which is which is really brilliant and i think we'll come on to this stuff a bit more but again you, you as a dad your your kids are a bit older than mine my boys one's year seven and one's year six this is something i've i found really difficult trying to get the balance between um a really positive relationship with 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 my boys and they want to hang out with me and, and often you know i'm sure this will resonate with a lot of parents they don't want to do homework um and you know whether we reframe it or you try and make it a really um enjoy trying to make it an enjoyable experience is is, is tough and we'll come on to those bits the, the, the first one I wanted to speak to you about, because it's very relevant to the work we've been doing at UHQ, is sleep. So there's a whole um, there's a whole space on, on the site about sleep and rest or rest and sleep, you called it. I'd love to talk to you about that. Now, just um, something I wanted to put forward to you. We, we've started collecting the anonymous data from the schools that we work with. Most of them are in the UK and some of them are abroad. By far and away, the, the number one reason why uh, students are saying they have low mood according to our app, is poor sleep, miles like ahead of everything else. And I just wanted to, to pick up with you on that and on, on um, the importance of sleep. We all know it, but I think the, the key thing that I find with sleep, and actually I'm quite lucky, one thing that my boys are quite good at is sleeping. I think they're so they're so physical and full on all day. They actually want to go to sleep. What what can parents really do, especially, you know, your kids are older. I imagine it, it just gets harder and harder the older they get. What What are the kind of key takeaways to try and get that that sleep context right so that your kids buy into it so that they you know have the best possible chance to learn each day when they get up yeah i think you're absolutely right and it and it it, it although, it, although it concerns me and saddens me it doesn't surprise me that what you said there in terms of the volume of concerns coming through the platform about sleep um what is really interesting though if we break this down if i start by talking about why it's important and the, and the benefits and then talk about maybe some of the practical ways to kind of enhance that if we look at it sequentially like that what's really interesting is that is that 
the research around this, and, and I, I, I listened to a few podcasts and a book on this, um, it, it's called you know Why We Sleep, and ultimately the um, the the research around this says that you know this is this is the easiest and freely available intervention for everyone that we do every single day, or we should do. Yet, how much of it is actually in our education systems? How much of it, you know, did did, did anyone really get a class at school on on sleep? You know, think about how much how many of the health campaigns are around stopping smoking or doing this or more exercise. But actually, when have you seen an advert on how to sleep better? You know, or the importance of sleep. Actually, it's really interesting that this is freely available, and and and, and you know, often it's it's neglected. So that, that that's the, the first point. The second point in terms of why it's so important is that what what's what's it amazed me when I was looking at the research is that we often think of sleep being a, a an inactive period, and actually it's something where we shut down and we kind of rest. But actually, what what the what the research in sleep tells us is that it's a really active phase in our mind. And what it does, it allows us to then make those memories really concrete. Um, so if so, if I, if I, if I take a, an example, if you are, uh, you know, if, if, you, if your child, let's say, is learning, let's say, some spellings at school, in primary school, or learning some, learning some kind of maths equations, if then they are not getting a good night's sleep beforehand, then they are less likely to be focused. They're less likely to be switched on and be able to concentrate. They're less likely to be able to process the hard details because they're in almost like a sleep deficit, okay? And they haven't then got that, that ability to, to, to do the really hard things in, in, in simple terms without getting into the kind of, the real kind of you know, physiology. Um, and, and, and that's really important to, to remember because think about it as, as adults. We know this, right? So if you've had a bad night's sleep, now, depending on what you class as a bad night's sleep, if that means you have not had enough sleep or you have woken up multiple times in the night, then actually you know that you will not feel as refreshed in the morning. You'll not feel uh, switched on. You'll feel longer to take to, to get going and all of these things. So we know this from our personal life. So this is nothing, it's not rocket science. Actually, we have, we, we've known what it's like. What also happens is you can't catch up on that sleep. So you can't then say, well, I'll have a, 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 I'll, I can just, you know, have four hours sleep tonight, but I'll have 12 or 13 hours that ultimately the damage has been done in that, in the lack of sleep there. What's also really interesting, and I wasn't really aware of this until, until kind of after I, I was, I read the book, is that um, it, the night after you do the learning is just as important as the night before. So the night before is the preparation to make sure that you are, you've got your mind into a fertile learning condition that you are ready to learn. But the night after is then the consolidation of what you've learned. And again, the scientists have looked at this and actually the night after is when all of those memories are, are um, put into kind of, you know, into, into the long-term memory and concrete memory. If you're not able to have a good night's sleep afterwards, then some of those memories therefore are lost. And the studies then demonstrate that people who've had a, a good night's sleep after they've learned something are far more likely statistically able to recall that information at a later date whereas the people that haven't had a good night's sleep afterwards have then forgotten and lost that information so that's really important to remember that it's not just the night before in terms of the preparation it's the night after so really really important to think about that so what does that mean then for for parents listening well what it means is that you can't just turn on and turn off sleep so you can't just say make sure you have a good night's sleep before an exam or make sure you have a good night's sleep once in a you know once in a while when something important's coming up we need to get into those constant routines so that we're always having the, you know, the, the amount of sleep we need so that we can consolidate our learning afterwards. Otherwise, you'll be prepared for learning, but not remembering it. And that's very that's a very inefficient state to be in. So tips for that is to make sure we have uh, routines. We all love routines in our life. We're creatures of habit, ultimately. So getting into a routine of if it's nine o'clock bedtime, half past nine, 10 o'clock, half past eight, whatever, whatever, I suppose, age or phase your child is, have that routine so it's not a battle every night because when it's half past eight, if that's what's been agreed, well, it's easy to then say, you know, right, it's approaching bedtime now. And again, as human beings, we like to be in routine. So our body doesn't like to be sleeping five hours one night, eight hours another night, 12 hours next night, three hours. You know, think about when you go on holiday and if you go on holiday to a, uh, if you if you cross multiple time zones, what happens is that first one or two nights, your body's all over the place because you don't know whether you're coming or going because you're waiting. You know, you might let's imagine you 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 get a flight to somewhere like America, 
you're up really early the next morning because your body is thinking it's ready to get up, but the clock is saying it's not. So we so think putting that back into our children, we can't we 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 can't expect their bodies to to, to adapt every night to different different waking hours, different sleep hours. If we get into a nice routine of going to sleep at roughly the same time, not exactly the same time, we're not robots, but roughly the same time and waking up at roughly the same time, then actually our body is used to it. It's automated. It's easy. We get into a groove. And as we know with anything, when we're in a groove and it becomes automated, it just becomes a habit and a way of life, which makes it a lot easier. So that would be the big tip. How we get to that point is another thing. So tips like, you know, removing mobile phones out of bedrooms at night, you know, rather than I think they're going to sleep and I think they've turned their phone off. But as I go downstairs, well, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, in terms of did they go back on their phone after I've gone back downstairs? What happens if their phone's buzzing all the time from notifications from their mates, even though they're trying to get to sleep, their mates might not be. So what's maybe the, moving no, their... what's the cutoff point? You're, you've got older kids. If you go, right, you hit this age and now I'm going to trust you. You know, I've given you, you know, I've given you the the, the learning and I've, I've tried to, you know, kind of uh, really put that forward in a positive way. Do you then hit an age and go, right, you know, over to you now, I'm going to trust you? Does it just depend on the individual yeah. child? I, I think so. And I, we do that with, we do that with our, our 15 year old. She's just about to t turn 16 and we do, we do that with her, but we equally have things where, you know, you can put things on do not disturb mode. And I don't just mean on silent, but actually, you know, do not disturb mode. So, cause you can put it on silent, but if that phone is like rested up and it's flashing and it's, it's flashing up, you know, lighting the room up, then just because it's on silent doesn't mean to say it's not then going to be kind of, you know, and we've all been there before probably where a phone is lighting the room up. And you're like, well, what's going on? So there are ways to do that. But equally, if you feel you have to, and I say this in one of my videos that, that, that's listed on, the, on the, the screen there about tech and phones, that most parents pay for the phones. If you have to and you want to, like, take charge of it. And I know that's difficult, and I, I know that, depending on the age and phase, phase of your child, that might cause you know, World War Three. But ultimately, you're the adult. You're probably paying for it. And it's about having those discussions about, you know, rather than just, I'm taking your phone off you, explain the importance of sleep. Explain the importance of a good night's sleep. Explain the importance of, but surely you want to learn and remember things rather than not learn things because you know, there's no point going to school if you're not going to learn anything, actually. So therefore, by taking my phone off, off you and put it on the landing so you can have a good night's sleep, you know, and they might say, well, I need it for my alarm. All right, buy them an alarm clock. You know, like, there are ways around these things, you know, mm -hmm. rather than, oh, I, 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 there's no way I can remove the phone out of the bedroom. Well, there is, you know, you can just work around it. Um, so, yeah, and then there's little things like making sure that the room's dark. You know, if you're going to try and go to sleep in a light room, or let's imagine the sun's coming through, you might want to get some you know, blackout curtains, you know, or, or, or a, you know, pull a blind down. So things like that. There are also things in the research about kind of generally and gently dropping the temperature throughout the house as well. Again, it, it, we know this as well. If you're really hot, you probably can't get to sleep. So actually by, 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 by dimming the lights after seven or eight o'clock in the house starts to make you feel a bit sleepier. And it goes back to kind of our, our caveman, I suppose, instincts of when it got dark, that's when people went to sleep and our bodies know that. So start to dim the lights, drop the temperature a little bit. And actually those things can make a big difference uh, in terms of sleeping for your for your child, so there are tips and tricks to, to do that. Um, you know, not having drinks right before bed, not you know, or or if they're older, not drinking caffeine or you know things you know before because again, those things are going to make it more difficult. I know that as an adult. You know, if I have a a drink half an hour before I go to bed, I'm probably going to be up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet. You know, which is going to disrupt my sleep. So it's all about thinking about the practical things that we know we can do to help our children. But uh, the big thing would be routines you know get them into a routine stick to those routines and potentially as well i know this is very difficult and it won't go down very well with children but try to stick to similar routines at weekends because actually if your routine at a weekend is totally different and your body almost gets out of the habit for two days or two or three days then monday is going to be you know a nightmare so actually how can we try and keep similar wake times or similar sleep times and again i know that that's easier said than done but if you're thinking about, especially in the run-up to an exam or an assessment, keeping those routines over a weekend in the run-up to that will make a difference and it'll make it easier for your body to, uh, to you know, to do that. So, yeah, hopefully lots of practical things there uh, that, that, that parents can take, either themselves as an adult, you know, if you're struggling to sleep, but equally for your children as well.
John, that's so useful. And I, I think that the takeaway for me as a parent there, you, because there's lots you can do, isn't there? But, but you know, there's there's many things. It's routine sounds like the, the kind of the simple, if you're going to do one thing, get into a routine, try and stick to that routine as best you can. It might not be perfect. Um, and, and also weekends as well, whilst you, you might want to let your head down a little bit at weekends uh, and relax the rules. You don't want to go mad because some of that good work's done undone. I, I love what you said about a good night's sleep prepares you for the, for the next day, but then a good night's sleep the day after gives you the recovery and, and the ability to process the memories. And we, we've just created some work on um, the different phases of sleep and how some phases are about, like you said, processing memories and, and allowing you the ability to learn. But then other um, phases of sleep are about recovering physically and then also recovering mentally. And therefore, it's not just the hours of sleep you get, but it's that quality of sleep. And, you know, we touched a little bit on tech um, before bed and all that kind of stuff. I think we, we could talk about this for a long time. I wanna, I'm want i going to move us on because there's another um, section on, on the podcast that I wanted to touch on was the brain dumps slash blurting. I thought I found it really interesting. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about it. And I also, I wanted just to um, put in, a, a, I, I was listening to a fantastic podcast of the day. And, and one part of the work that we do is around journaling. But journaling from a kind of, from a well-being mental health perspective, whether it's gratitude journaling or, or you know, totally unstructured anything. And I, I wanted to just to pick your brains a bit on that side of things, because obviously, on your podcast, it was it was it's geared towards learning and and you know mind mapping and that kind of stuff. Just wanted to gauge your thoughts on brain dumps slash blurting and also the potential links to journaling and how pro again processing those thoughts and those learnings and getting them out of your system is so useful and beneficial and how and maybe again how parents can help their their children do that from home. Yeah, and I, and I think it's useful for lots of different angles. So we'll, we'll probably we'll probably take four or five different kind of angles to this here. So if I, if I start with the, the first one in terms of the, what I think is probably the most basic and obvious one, is it? So what what a brain dump is for anybody who doesn't know what that is 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 where you literally just write down or get your child to write down on a bit of paper everything that they know about a certain subject, and what that what that does is it it does what we call it recalls and retrieves information. Now. If you uh, if you don't do that recall, then actually it's it's very very difficult to then kind of hopefully try to remember information. So to remember things, we do as many recall questions as we can, and that, that, that's how we remember it. And if I give you an example of that, um, the example I always use with adults, um, and it's interesting now when I say adults, I have to judge how old the adults are when I use this example. Is I always say, can you remember your landline telephone number? Now sometimes when I test young teachers, they're like, what's a landline, John? And I'm like, oh yeah, I realize how old I've got now. But if, you, if you're listening or watching to this and you say, yeah, I can remember my landline telephone number. How, do you, how can you remember that? Why? Lots of people say to me, well, I had to answer the phone by saying what your number was, right? So it was a recall. You were recalling that number all the time. Um, or you had to remember it at the phone box if you wanted, if you wanted mom or dad to pick you up. You know, so you, you had to use it. So you had to recall it and you had to kind of almost physically do it. So it was a physical recall, either committing it to your lips or punching it into a you know to a number whereas nowadays on a phone you just hold someone's num uh, name down you, you don't know numbers um so taking that back into what, why why that's important for a brain dump what it what it is is that it's it's a recall activity and it and it's a physical activity so you're having to actually put it onto paper and i always say as well as that if you can't write it down doesn't matter if you think you know it if you can't write it you're not going to get a mark for it in an exam you might think you know it and what's very interesting is when you talk to even adults you know, any human being, you say, how much do you know about this topic? And they go, oh, yeah, I know loads about it. Okay, I'm going to give you two minutes, write as many things down that bit of paper as you can about it. And suddenly it's like, Ugh. and after about 20 seconds or so, people get stuck. So it's a really good way to to, 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 to visually see how much you can remember. And the other great thing about it is that you don't need any specialist equipment. It's just a, a paper, pen and paper, and it can look very different. So it, it can be bullet points, it can be spider diagram, it can be a mind map, it can be a paragraph. It can be whatever, pictorial diagrams, doesn't matter. It's the act of getting it from your brain onto a bit of paper that then strengthens the memory. So that's really useful. Um, and I suppose going thinking that the, the, the link there in terms of what you mentioned about in terms of journaling is that it's that physical act of actually, you know, being able to write it down. Now, you mentioned two things there in terms of journaling. One, it's really great for processing what is what, what you're doing or what you're thinking. Um, and if that's a you know if, if that's a, to be able to recall it back at a further a later date or to, or to be able to read you know what you felt or, or how you're feeling great but secondly you also mentioned 
kind of how that you, you can almost have that release. So actually, rather than bottling it up or keeping it to me, the fact that I can write it down, it, it and I speak to a lot of people about this, it, it feels like it's that it, it's potentially gone, or or at least I, you know, it's I've and, I, and and I can also visualize it, so I can see it, you know. Um, and one thing that was interesting, you you asked me before about when I got into kind of talking and writing about teaching and learning. When I started blogging, I, I I really got into the habit of what have I done in my classroom? Why has it worked? What's been the impact? How have I got there? And I was then able to sequentialize that. Because if I was writing a blog, I was then thinking, who wants to know this? Well, it's another teacher. What do they need to know? They need to know what John's done, how John's done it, what he used, what were the problems, what was the impact, what to avoid. So it enabled me to really reflect on what I was doing. It enabled me to process my thoughts. And, and it did really feel very, very therapeutic to be able to kind of write that and look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's why I did it. And that was the impact. Whereas in my head before that, it was just, oh, I've done loads of this stuff and I think it's really useful. But to be able to write it down, knowing that there's an audience for that. Now, yes, my work was public because it was a blog, but actually being able to then, if you had, you know, something that you wanted to, 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 to journal, let's say, from a, a stress management point of view, from an emotional well-being point of view, the fact that you can then say, this is what it is, this is what I'm feeling, this is why I'm feeling this way, this is how I'm going to get out of it, or et cetera, et cetera, then actually that is the first step rather than kind of, you know, and it, so I think it is really useful, whether it's, as we say, brain dump and a blurting for a, from a learning point of view uh, to be able to see it, or equally from a from an emotional point of view, I think writing um, and we, we, we've always known this. Again, this isn't a secret to anyone. Why have people? Why have people? And it, it, it's less so now. I think or less less common. But why did people create diaries? You know, why did people keep those diaries? It was to be able to put those thoughts down, to reflect, to sequentialize, to be able to look back on things, to be able to look back on that's when I was feeling sad, that's when I was my happiest, or you know, well, when I was at my happiest, what was I doing? Well, I was doing these things. Am I doing them now? No, I'm not. I need to go back to those things then that made me happy. So I think there's a lot to be said about that. And I think that's really useful. I love that. And it's, you know, we use the term emotional intelligence just by writing something down. You you know, whether you're um, whether you're improving your your academic learning, your, your your intelligence in that sense, or whether it's your self-awareness and your emotional intelligence, like you said, it's it's almost like a release, that therapeutic release on both sides makes a lot of sense. I really like that. Um, I'm going to, I want to ask you one more uh, question because I've been trying after watching the podcast on the Pomodoro technique. That's something I've been really trialing because I think I'm one of those people, probably like a lot of people out there that, that gets into things and, and, you know, I might be sat down for an hour and haven't been that productive, especially since I've been working from home. Um, I'd like to talk to you um, about that and, and your thoughts on that. And again, how parents listening can maybe use that technique or, or, or at least encourage their children to, to adopt that sort of technique and why, again, why it's so helpful. Yeah, so the Pomodoro technique is, uh, it comes from the name of the old kind of tomato chip kitchen timer that, that many people might, might be familiar with um, from, from, I suppose, days gone by. And what it, what it says is that we should only really be doing uh, a study period or a bit of homework or a bit of, you know, work for 25 minutes at a time. And the reason that is, is because our mind starts to become fatigued, which, again, we would expect nothing new here this is kind of you know if you sat and try to work for two three hours at a time then you might think that you're doing a good job you might think that you're putting the time in but just like if you were a sprinter you become very fatigued and you are not sprinting as fast as you could do it you might be sprinting as fast as you physically can at that point but it's massively fatigued and and and, and performance has dipped from where, where you're being. so what we would, we would always say is that 25 minutes at a time and a five minute break. And interestingly, Jez, you mentioned there about, about you at home and, and, and kind of home working. What I would always profess is that in that five minute break time, you need to have a proper break. Not I'll just stop doing this and I'll do something different. No, no, you need to get, you need to stop, almost shut the laptop or shut the book, get up out of your chair and actually have a, a, a mental break, but a physical bit of exercise. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about running around the running around the you know the you know the estate but just going to the toilet gets you up it gets your blood circulating again it gets the oxygen pumping around your body it gets you active and moving you might go and grab a drink and go to the toilet and then when you come back down and you sit back down after 10 minutes or five minutes um, to move to do your next pomodoro your next 25 minutes you are mentally and physically refreshed ready to go what that means is that 
the next 25 minutes, you will be working really, really hard at your optimum level rather than 50 or 60 minutes in where you're starting to flag because when you're when you're becoming tired, you're nowhere near as productive. You make you start to make silly mistakes. Um, you are you're not focused as much, and you're not in that kind of state of complete flow. So, 25 minutes, five minute break, 25 minutes. So for parents, thinking about that, if if your child was going to do an hour's work in a, in a subject, split it, 25 minutes work. Now this is where you can really help as parents. Time it. Remove the mobile phone from the bedroom so that there's no distractions going on. And we might talk about that in a minute in terms of the dangers of that. But remove the mobile phone. Again, pre-agreed, not suddenly, and I'm taking that because then, you know, it all blows up. But have it all agreed. We know what the the, the, you know, the rules are for study. I'll, we'll put the phone, and again, you don't need to have it because sometimes as kids get older, it might be, well, I, I'm not, I don't, you don't want to have my phone, but actually we'll have it on the landing or we'll put it in, in the drawer, whatever it is. 25 minutes, complete science. I'll time it and then after 25 minutes I'll come in you can then get, get up have a break etc et and then you sit back down again for, for round two now you might do two 25 minute pomodoros of the same subject or you might decide you want to do maths for 25 minutes five minute break and then on to English completely up to you how that works but certainly I wouldn't advise going past 25 minutes for one sitting yes you might need to do three hours of maths fine split it though in 25 minute chunks again we know this from our personal experience However, if you are sitting at home and you are working from home all day and you're in meetings or that, get up and go to the toilet or just go, just walk around the kitchen, you know, just go and grab a drink. That act of getting up and around will make it much, uh, you know, much more productive for you. And you then also don't get things like back pains and kind of, you know, it, you know, aches and so, just get up and move around. So, yeah, that will help hopefully parents as well as, uh, as well as their children. And, and, you know, one of the things you said there was pre-agreed and that, that so, you know, We've talked about um, bed routine. Um, we've talked about uh, Pomodoro, and we've also talked about the brain dump. If it becomes a fight, if it becomes an argument, you know what? Because this is something I want to come on to from my experience as a parent as well. What's your advice there? Do you, you know how how if you've got a resistant child who just goes, "I'm not doing Pomodoro technique," or "No, I'm, you can't take my phone away from me." I, you know, I know this is a difficult one, but you know how are there strategies? that you have where parents can can actually go in relatively confident that they can they can pre-agree these these rules isn't the right word but these ideas and these concepts so that, so that everyone's on board yeah I, I and i think that the the easiest way well the most effective and obvious way to do this is to just explain the why not not and not there and then if you're doing it there and then you've lost it and it ain't going to work and it's going to be hell I, it, you know like from personal experience it's not a good, right? So this needs to be pre-agreed potentially at the start of the week or at the start of the academic year or the start of, or you know, whatever it is. Or even if you want to remind them again, because you might have pre-agreed it and it's like, no, that was ages ago. I've, I've, maybe even remind them again on the day. Or if they're going to do some, you know, some work at six o'clock and you're having tea at five o'clock, you know, just remind them of, of what's of what's coming in the, the pre-agreement. And the reason that's really important is because and I think why it's effective is if you were, if I was working with you, Jez, you and my son, and I said, and you, and you said, I don't want to do a Pomodoro, like that's ridiculous. My my selling the why would be, Jez, do you really want to sit at your desk for two hours or three hours and not be not be efficient and and not learn stuff and become t like is that is that good? now? I don't think unless you're just being awkward, your answer to that can be yes. Like, because you don't want to be inefficient. You want to look, everyone wants to learn the most amount of information in the least time. Like, that's got to be our goal. We need to be as efficient as possible. And actually, if you're then starting to explain that and saying, well, but, you know, you might think you're you're doing more, but you're not because you're making mistakes. You, you, you're only taking half as much information in. What's the point? And I think that that's where we, where we have to level with our children to say, you know, let's face it certain kids will want to put the least amount of effort in to get the most amount of impact so let's let's level with them and say well to do that this is the best way possible things like mobile phones as well they might want their phone with them but it's explaining that if you're and if if you've got a, a you know a teenage uh, son or daughter all you have to do is just watch their phone for the for about a minute or so and watch how many times it lights up in that minute and it's quite frightening the research on this says that if you're multitasking like that and if you're constantly, so if I'm, let's imagine I'm working and looking at the screen 
and my phone my phone's here right so if i if this is so I've, I've got my phone turned around actually at the moment so i can't see it if i if i look the way around and twitter is flashing up or snapchat or or whatsapp all i need to do is just that little look and then it takes me twice as long to get back into my state of flow and probably i'm then going to start to make mistakes because i'm constantly especially if it's you know if it's once all right fair enough but if it's like every 10 15 seconds i'm constantly constantly not focused on what i'm doing which means it's going to take me so much longer to achieve anything and therefore they're going to be in their bedroom at their desk trying to work and not getting stuff right for longer like it doesn't make any sense so i think it's just leveling with them and being really open and honest about and 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 not accepting the rubbish not accepting this kind of no 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 i'm okay with that no no like this is how the human mind works like this isn't just like how you know jez is okay with this no no like nobody is these distractions no matter who we are and again we know this ourselves all right this it takes us out of our state of flow so it's been it's been the adult it's been the person who sells the why and it's been the person that says you know I, I i know how the brain works and you know you can't tell me that like you're okay watching all these distractions all the time while you're trying to work or having your music or tv on in the background and phone on all these distractions are not going to work so it's about explaining that but being strong enough to say and this is how it's going to work and however you get to that agreement every situation is going to be different isn't it getting that pre-agreed and reminding them of that agreement um, because it's all about it makes it more efficient and and effective for them, which is ultimately what they want. Yeah, that's really good, John. And, you know, I was just thinking then, uh, you, you must have had this as a PE teacher. I remember when kids would come up to me, the ones that hate PE, and say, what's the point in PE? And I'd always explain the why and I'd always explain the benefits of physical activity and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and again, if you don't feel confident at the moment about the why, then go go to the from the sidelines.uk uh website and it's all free and you can see it in the bottom and even if you don't want to spend much time some of them are one minute videos that just explain it they give you enough information you can watch the slightly longer podcasts as well um they're, they're really interesting they just give you and they're, and they're done in a really um useful way the language isn't super scientific but there is some science to back it up and it, it's really helpful and for me i'm definitely starting to struggle on multiple i've got you know i've got messages coming in from email and slack and whatsapp and everything else it's, it's really difficult in this modern age it must be so hard for young people uh, and you know i think we will go on to phones and, and tech and stuff in a second can i just backtrack slightly because we talked about the brain dump i think the pomodoro technique that's that's brilliant it's fairly simple pre-agreed 25 minute blocks um and, and i also think the sleep uh, whilst it's difficult sleep and it's complicated and obviously you know if you start throwing phones and tech and all that sort of stuff in there even just going back to what you said get into that routine I think is really important with the brain dump side how do parents what would be the scenario if a parent wanted to to employ that sort of strategy can you think of a good scenario for that because I, you know i'm the typical dad i say to my son how was school today yeah it was all right what did you learn you know a bit of maths and then that's it you know i'd love to then be able to go okay let's get a bit of paper and is that the way you, you would suggest to do it yeah, there's two or three ways. I mean, uh, children can do it themselves as part of their own kind of uh, study and revision tool because it's it, it's a it, it can be a measurement tool in terms of how much have you learned, but it's also a learning tool in itself because actually by recalling and having to physically do it, it then strengthens the memory. So it's it's a it's a it's a measurement tool as well as a learning tool. So it might be that they want to kind of do it themselves as part of their revision. It might be that you say, okay, right, can you show me, you know, uh, what you've learned. Um, today at school you might want to say at the end of a 25 minute pomodoro right you've been revising this you've been learning this after the after our break i want you to do a uh, do a brain dump where you're going to shut your book you're going to have nothing to look at you're going to need to tell me everything that you've learned now that can be quite an eye opener because kids and adults think we've learned a lot and suddenly then it's the oh there's not much on this bit of paper and then that's a really good way to then be able to say all right so you've spent 25 minutes there and you haven't learned much so how have you done it and then because again nobody wants to sit there and think they've done a good job in, in learning and remembering things and then when it comes to putting it down on paper they can't do it so that that might be a bit of a, a way in to be able to say let, let's look at a different way um but absolutely it, i mean it, what another good way is to, is to is for parents in terms of thinking you can time it so you might want to add a bit of challenge so it's not like here's your bit of paper take as long as you want it might be because Remember, we're trying to put children in the similar position as they're going to be in terms of an exam sometimes, right? They're not going to have all day 
or three hours to do a question. They go um, as in secondary school, we work on normally a minute per mark. You know, parents I'm sure will be familiar with that from their, their own schooling. That if it's a six mark question, you're looking at six, you know, six minutes. So you might want to say this to, to your child, right? Here, here's a bit of paper, plain paper, lined paper, it makes no difference. Here's a pen, pencil, colored pencil. Again, it doesn't make a difference. You've I'm going to give you five minutes, three minutes, four minutes, whatever it is, to write down as much as you know on here. Um now, that's a good way to do that because it puts it in a bit of a time challenging way. What it's also nice to do is to keep that brain dump and maybe file it. Because if that's the first time they've done one, the next time they do a brain dump on the same topic in maybe two weeks' time, you're hoping that there's more on the page this time because that demonstrates to them visually that they've, they've learned more and been able to remember more. A bit like going to the gym. If you run on the treadmill and you can only run for two minutes, Next week, you go back and you run five minutes. Week after, like, you can visually see you are improving, all right? So, again, this is a nice way for them to be able to improve by seeing V1, V2, V3, version 4, et cetera, et cetera. Now, they might want to add things in a different color afterwards. What have I forgotten? But you're looking at how much did I get in the first color to begin with, and then there's a nice way to be able to, as you as a parent as well, I can see that actually they are learning more. And then what a great way to be able to say, wow, let's look at it. It's a bit like, if I suppose, if you are – trying to lose weight. When you look in the mirror every single day, it's very hard to see the difference. If suddenly someone stops you in the street and goes, eh, I haven't seen you for ages. You're looking great. How much weight have you lost? Or you look at a photograph from six months ago. And that's the idea of keeping those brain dumps to be able to look at version one to version four and go, wow, look how much I've now been able to recall. I think visually that's really, that, that, that's really important because we often get stuck in the rut of, I'm just not learning this stuff, or I'm not, I don't feel I'm getting any better, or I don't feel I'm losing weight, or I don't feel I'm getting any fitter. To be able to see your like your baseline and where you are now in any shape or form in life, I think is really important. That's really useful. Thanks, John. Um, if there are, if anyone's out there and they're listening and they want to ask any questions, then please um, do post them, um, and then Sophie will will put them out um, for us to pick up on. But I, we could talk about this next topic for ages, I'm sure. So rather than go into every detail, if you technology phones, really difficult, difficult at school, really difficult at home. What would be your top tip if there was one thing to take away from, from tech and, and your kids at home on tech? You know, whether it's from a learning perspective, general well-being, what, what, what would you say, John, to that? I know it's a difficult question. Yeah, I think my my overall message would be that, and this is goes for us as adults as well as kids, this is just about human beings that our phones are destroying our ability to focus. That would be my one takeaway. And I, I will break that down now. Um, if you think about children, they are now in a, a cycle of wanting to be entertained or stimulated every 15, 20, 30 seconds from a, a TikTok point of view. Uh, very short, sharp, snappy TikTok, Instagram, kind of YouTube reels, et cetera, et cetera. And their level of being able to, their, their sustained level of focus is, is, is has been diminished because of that. So our brains are now starting to be rewired for short, sharp bursts of entertainment. Um, what it also does, as I mentioned before, about distractions, they constantly take our take our distract our focus and our flow. So the big thing would be that folks need to be out of completely out of the room when your son or daughter is doing some homework, studying, revising reading anything that requires concentration now lots of children will say i'll just put it on silent it's okay just turn it face down that's not good enough the reason it's not good enough is because again if i relate this back to us as adults how many times do we as adults pull our phone out of our pocket just to see if somebody has messages us? right it hasn't buzzed you just check in because there's unfortunately as awful as it sounds we are addicted to to that phone and it's such a pull so if we know that and we're adults and we are allegedly responsible and mature, then what do you think your child is doing if that phone is on silent in their bedroom? They're still looking at it. And if it's faced up and it's on silent, it's still flashing. If it's face down at silent, they're probably still grabbing it and checking it. And if they're checking it and there has been a message on there, then they'll start looking at it. We've just got to get rid of the phone. Take it out. Again, put it on the landing, put it in a different room, whatever. We've got to remove it. And thinking about as, as a slight kind of move into music and, and, and distractions from, from a technology point of view, lots of children will say to you as, as parents, uh, I like to, or I need to, not I like to, I need to listen to music while I'm, while I'm revising. 
it helps them revise, right? Now, there's a lot of science being done about this. And generally, in most cases, not everyone, but in the vast majority of cases, listening to music while you're revising does nothing for the learning. All it does is make you multitask. And what I mean by that is if you are listening to something that you know the words of, or you know songs coming next because it's on your playlist, you are nodding along or humming along and you're kind of, you're thinking about what that is. So therefore you're not giving 100% to the task at hand, which is what you want. So it's about removing as many of those distractions as possible. And also picking up on a point I made uh, a while ago, we need to get students and children, just like a sports performers, Jez, to practice in the conditions that they go to perform in. Now that's an exam hall and that'll be in silence. So you can't have them learning all the time and revising with music on all the time and then suddenly put them an exam of two hours in total silence because that's not going to be good. They're going to be freaked out by it. It's not going to work because they're going to be like, well, I, I, but I always have my music. So we need to get them into a period of time where they are comfortable being in periods of silence. And again, we know this. If you want to really, really concentrate, you don't need distractions. You don't need music. You need real silence, deep thinking, and the ability to kind of work that for yourself. So that would be the big takeaway. But I, let me put a caveat. I know it's not easy. Like, it's real difficult. But again, just because it's difficult doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be the adults and shouldn't be the ones that are saying, I know what's best for learning. Do you think it's important for us as adults at home to to practice what we preach in this way then, John? So if we're saying, you know, if our boys now often say to, to my wife and I, well, you're on your phones, you're on your phones all the time. Um, is it how important is that would you say to role model i think that's really important and i think it's also very difficult um but i think it's really important to to, to try and be at least be conscious of that role modeling we might not get it get it right but if you're going to go to bed with your phone in your room and you're telling them not to again what does that say um you know if you're sat at the dinner table you know on your phone and then you tell them not to again what's that? and then you might say you might pull out the card that, well, it's important, it's work stuff. So what? Like, you're, you're modelling that actually they're not important and your phone is, you know? And, you know, we all replicate things we see and we're role models to our kids. So if, if our kids see us doing that all the time, then they're going to think that that's the adult world and that's what they do. So I, I, I really do think that's really important, a role model, um, and just be conscious of kind of how you do it, when you do it, and almost be a bit more overt about it as well. You know, rather than just putting your phone away and not saying anything, actually saying, I'm putting my phone away now because I need, really need to concentrate on this. You know, and, and almost because, just because you've done it doesn't mean to say they know it, know what, why you're doing it. So mm. be overt about, I'm doing this because I need, and, and, and almost, you know, demonstrate that it's all adults need to do that at the same time as well, rather than, rather than, no, it's just, because otherwise it becomes a, a controlling kind of naughtiness. You need to put your phone away, put your phone, actually just demonstrate that it's human behavior. Yeah, and the, the removal of the, I've personally tried really hard in the evening to just put, leave my phone upstairs. That, that physical removal of the phone is so important because you can just use it for everything, can't you? You can use it for music. Um, you can use it for all sorts of different things. I think that's that's really important and really powerful. And look, I imagine we'd be able to talk for another hour all about phones and tech. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, we haven't got that long left. I wanted to ask you a question, but sort of from a personal point of view, really, John. I, you know, I've, I've mentioned I've got two boys um, one in particular really struggles academically uh, and often when we speak to a school he they say he, he sometimes isn't really emotionally ready to even sit down and embark on on these things we've been talking about you know what what are your thoughts and experiences um, you know from your teaching background of, of maybe more neurodiverse children you know we've, we've got all these things they make total sense to us you know my, my eldest for example um, loves music and I'm quite happy. I love I love music, and I, I know you know. I'm sure you do as well. Um, it, it does seem with with the autism side, it does seem to kind of that sensory side of it does seem to help him relax. And I wouldn't say focus because I totally agree with what you're saying. But are there any caveats to to the sort of things we've been talking about? Where at home you might have to go look. I you know I can't have everything right. I can't have total silence, and I can't have the tech away and everything else. Or, or would you say no? Really, you should be focusing on the, on these things altogether. Yeah, there are some caveats, and I think that that's why I said a few minutes ago that, like, about about the silence that it, it, in most cases, okay, mm. um, and certainly from a neurodivergent point of view, sometimes that actually that, that there is a there is a, a, a way to do that. Now, what I would say though is, if there's a need for music, now and I'll, I'll give it a concrete example in a minute of why that might be. Have something without lyrics again. 
because actually the lyrics then that's that's the that's the multitasking whereas actually something without lyrics can can, it can be that noise that they might need to kind of to, to tune in and tune out what i mean by that is if you're in a if you're in a, a silent place so if, if you're in let's say you're at, you're at home or you're in a bedroom and it can be silent for the vast majority of people i don't think there's any substitute for silence i think silence is the best okay for for, for, for most people um however if you're in somewhere that's quite noisy let's imagine you're in a coffee shop let's imagine you are in a house where there's quite a bit of noise happening uh you know the kitchen the microwave is is is, is being in you know you've got other people in the house etc etc and 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 you can't have that silence then music can be really really good to block out all of those random distractions because the music is the constant and the music allows you to shut everything else off around you and almost focus on what you're doing again if it has no lyrics it's even better because what you don't want is then the door shutting in a minute and then the microwave going and then someone shouting because all of those are like a mobile phone distraction they're not planned you don't know when it's going to happen and suddenly oh, 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 and then you're looking all the time whereas if you can shut all out and have that music and it shuts the outer world out and you can concentrate on something and that's really useful so again that from a from a neurodivergent point of view that might be really useful as well to be able to kind of to bring that kind of sense of calm away from the the kind of um the dynamic surroundings and have that kind of thing that i can control um but but, but ultimately again there's a the, the ultimate caveat is that's fine but can your can you is your son going to be allowed to have their headphones and music on in the exam probably not mm -hmm. So therefore, yeah. we just need to be aware that yes, that might be great in that moment, but if that is repeated and sustained and becomes a habit and ultimately becomes a crutch, then actually, are we are we are we doing the you know, the best for them down the line, or do we need to think about how we kind of wean them off, or, or because ultimately it, it can then become more of a distraction because then suddenly they have to you know they have to do it without it. So yeah, it, it is it's it's really interesting. He's not going to be happy when I tell him he's got to listen to Mozart and he can't listen to Storms anymore, John. I'll just tell him that's what you said and I'll send him your way. Um, John, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll be able to find a Stormzy karaoke version without the lyrics. That is just, <laughs> it's just music. Rather, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, John, we, we've run out of time. I mean, I knew it would be like this. It's we And we've barely scratched the surface. Thank you so much for, for joining me today and, and for just telling us a little bit about some of the work you do. If people want to find out more about you, We've talked a lot about the From the Sidelines podcast. Where else can they find you and, and where are good spots for people to go? Yeah, thanks, James. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Team Tate. Uh, I think it's on the screen there now. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, and also, you mentioned the, the, the From the Sidelines website. From the Sidelines is also on all the social media platforms as well. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, on, uh, on YouTube, uh, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, you can search for From the Sidelines. I think on Twitter and Instagram, Things it's the underscore sidelines too, um, but you can you can find us on there. Or certainly, if you find me, you'll see that I've been posting lots of stuff. So I know lots of people like to follow things on social media, so it drops into their inbox rather than to go to a website. But that would be the best thing to do. Um, and um, yeah, feel free to people to reach out to me if you've got any questions at any point. I'm happy to work to help out. And John, would you say to the parents that don't try and do everything at once? Don't try and get everything sorted. Play around with the bits maybe identify the areas where, where maybe your children find things the most difficult and just and, and don't force it just just you know pre-agree it like you said but see how it goes don't let it put a strain on your relationship ultimately this should be something that you can do together that that, that builds you that, that builds that relationship and brings you closer together yeah 100 percent. and i think the first thing i would advocate is to upskill yourself and educate yourself to begin with so if that's watching some of the videos and understanding what the mobile phone distractions are why why listening to music isn't good educate yourself so you're at the position where you believe it and you know it and then it's a lot easier to then have and sell that conversation with your with your child but as you said don't try and do everything at once don't try and suddenly have a massive diff a massive change overnight bit by bit work it through and just because it doesn't work once doesn't mean it's, it's never going to work you know it might be the fact that it's been they've had a bad day at school or you're you're tired or it's late at night you're trying to do it you know I'll stick to it if you really believe it then uh, then you know it, it should work so uh yeah upskill yourself brilliant john thank you so much again for joining us and and thanks for all the work you do you deliver it in such a great way and uh yeah we'll uh, hopefully see you again soon thanks mate. it's been a, yeah, it's been a pleasure thank you cheers bye now bye